What role, if any, does reason play in our ethical abilities generally and our moral intuitions more specifically? Bandura notes that massive threats to human welfare stem mainly from deliberate acts of principle rather than unrestrained acts of impulse. And he goes on to note, um, and he develops this actually over several decades of work, that those principles and their role in guiding the action seems to involve quite a significant role for reason. So for example, um, he and his colleagues studied prison executioners, so people who are prison workers who are involved in the execution of prisoners, uh, different groups of these people involved at different stages, and they note, among other things, that the executioners, who face the most daunting moral dilemma, adopted moral, economic, and societal security justifications for the death penalty. So here it looks like there's a clear role for reason in enabling people to perform uh, moral actions, actions which are harmful, and probably that those executioners were averse to performing initially, and for them also to uh, adopt attitudes, to condone those attitudes. So on the face of it, this points to a role for reason in moral, just, uh, moral intuition, uh, and also ethically relevant actions more generally. It seems like humans often have let's say, feelings which would prevent them performing certain actions, but by a process of reasoning, they can alter their intuitions and perform different actions. Now, we'll look more at that later. What I want to know for now is something very simple. There are researchers, here's uh, Prince, he's one of them, who offer a rather extreme view about the limits of reason in moral intuition. So Prince says, if we ask people why they hold a particular moral view, their reasons are often superficial and post hoc. If their reasons are successfully challenged, the moral judgment often remains. Now, in some ways, I don't think we should take this view of Prince's seriously. You see, Prince at this point in his discussion, it's a bit before page 32 actually, that comes later, it's around about page 20, 25, 28. Uh, he's actually discussing the phenomenon of dumbfounding, of moral dumbfounding that we, that we were talking about a moment ago. Um, and what you'll notice if you've if you read Prince is that there's no sign in what he's writing that he's actually read the study on moral dumbfounding. And you'll know if you if you saw the previous section on moral dumbfounding uh, why that is. You see, the study on moral dumbfounding itself involves a contrast between two kinds of morally provocative situation. One involves genuine harm, and one, in, one is actually harmless. And what Hyde and colleagues report in that unpublished 2000 paper is that there's a contrast between the two kinds of situation. Reasoning seems to play a larger role in one than the other. That's actually how they get to moral dumbfounding, by doing a contrast in the way that reason operates. So it provides approximately no justification whatsoever for the claim that Prince is making here. Now, rather hilariously, if you look at what Prince is saying, he goes to great lengths to offer five explanations for the moral dumbfounding findings. He considers five different explanations for moral dumbfounding uh, on, on the basis of uh, an unspecified piece of pure reasoning. He opts for the one that favours uh, this view here. Um, and the reason that, that I think that's somewhat humorous as an approach is that, you know, there's just no sign at all that he's actually read the research. He's gone to the trouble to come up with lots of potential explanations for it, but he doesn't seem to have actually paid careful attention to what those researchers were doing, as far as I can make out. Uh, and this is why I say to you, never trust a philosopher. So Prince, of course, is a is a famous and excellent philosopher, uh, one of the leading figures here in this area. Um, but you should not trust those philosophers when they're talking about research, because they often are not playing careful attention to detail. Or perhaps you're going to tell me I'm missing something, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I think this view is entirely unfounded. So on the one hand, I don't want to take it too seriously because uh, it's really based on a rather appalling piece of argument in my view. On the other hand, um, it's actually quite a widespread view and Prince provides a good articulation of it. So let's look at how we might confront this view. In fact, Prince goes on and makes an even bolder claim. So he says, Basic values are implemented in our psychology 
in a way that puts them outside certain practices of justification. Basic values seem to be implemented in an emotional way. Now, I'm not impressed with the idea that there's an argument for this claim, although if you can offer me an argument, a good argument, I'd be very interested. But what I am struck by is this thought. There seems to be a natural clash between research in social sciences about how various people who are perpetrating inhumane actions, for example, killings, so things which are quite violent, um, and what many of the philosophers were offering us by way of the idea of moral intuitions, the idea that these are not really subject to practices of justification, but rather are entirely a consequence of, you know, feelings or effect or some other built-in thing that isn't susceptible to reason. It seems to me that on the face of it, there's a conflict between these two views. And that conflict provides us a reason to, a further reason to reject Prince's view, actually. I think that's right, because I think this is based on observation and, and this is really a conjecture. But let me see if I can make this a bit sharper for you. So this is the basic picture. Um, but I'm going to try and make it a bit sharper for you. But just before I do that, I should mention that I take this observation to be due to Hendrix, uh, and you'll see him cited below in the notes. Uh, it's not that he says exactly this, so I'm, I'm being fairly free in my interpretation of Hendrix's work. It's that he points us in this direction. Uh, he's a bit more careful than I'm being, so don't blame him if I've gone horribly wrong here. Maybe I've gone horribly wrong. So let me try and sharpen things up. Um, I do like an inconsistent triad, I couldn't find a triad, so, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to make do with a dyad on this occasion. I hope that's OK. Uh, so the first part of my inconsistent dyad is, is the claim. This is a bit like Prince, but it's actually a bit more subtle. So this is Hyde and Bjorklund. Uh, so they say that moral reasoning is usually engaged in after a moral judgment is made, in which a person searches for arguments that will support an already made judgment. So this is, this is their idea. Um, you have a... A, a situation, a dilemma, something that calls for moral judgment or moral action, uh, you decide what you're going to do. And then if necessary, if you need some reasons for that, you then engage in some reasoning post hoc and try and work out what the reasons provided for it would be. Um, and that's how they think it usually works. Now, in this paper, they offer a figure. Um, and it's worth spending a bit of time with this figure even now, because this figure is uh, actually a component, or rather the model it represents, is a component of something called moral foundations theory, which will be important in the second part of this course. Uh, so it's worth spending a bit of time with this now because it's quite an important view. The moral foundations theory is, and this is quite a significant component of it. So what you can see here, we've got the listing situation. So somebody says to you, gosh, you know, uh, I need you to um, execute this prisoner. And, and you have some kind of intuition. Um, and I think what Bandura and his colleagues generally find is that on the face of it, people, they might think in the abstract that they'd be good or bad at this job, but they find that pretty difficult. So the intuition sort of is generally that they're not going to do that and they shouldn't do that. Um, and that says Heidenbjörglund's, Heidenbjörglund in, informs the judgment and that in turn goes over and informs their reasoning. Now they do know that reasoning can affect judgment. That's the dotted arrow five. Um, but they comment that they think this is something which is rare and not particularly significant. They also think that the reasoning can inform the intuition. But again, they think that that is something which is exceptional and not particularly interesting. In fact, they think it's mainly interesting in the case of philosophers who are presented with interesting ethical puzzles like the uh, contrast between the trolley and the transplant puzzle. What's important is that there's also a social aspect to their view. Uh, so they actually think that what happens is that the uh, judgment and the reasoning that one person performs actually affects the more directly the intuition of another person. So when you're doing a piece of reasoning, it probably won't affect your judgment or intuition, but it might well affect another person's intuition. Right. Uh, and conversely, their judgment will affect your intuition. So they think that reasoning is important and it has this kind of broad social long term function, but that the effects of reasoning go via intuition. Now, the thing to note here is that that seems to be entirely consistent with the work from Bandura and colleagues on uh, atrocities and inhumane acts generally, because there it seems that what's happening is that the reasoning actually has to overcome, to work against the intuition in order to get to the judgment. Uh, and it doesn't do that over a long period of time. So surely there are uh, social factors there. And indeed, that's one of the things that Bandura and colleagues ex express. So that seems that the social part of this may well be correct. Um, 
but that arrow five is probably mistaken there. Probably that needs to be a much more significant force. Now, there's a second thing which is puzzling about this diagram, um, which is that B's reasoning does seem to play quite a big role for B's judgment. So this is a solid rather than a dotted line. When I looked at the text of Hyde and Bjorklund again, I was puzzled about this arrow, so I went back to the text. I couldn't find a good explanation. So my working assumption here is that that solid arrow is a mistake and they don't intend that to be there. I can't see how that could be there, um, but not in the case of A. So I, th I think that probably shouldn't be there. Or it should be a dotted line, perhaps. Perhaps they just forgot to pop in a, a few dots. All right, so that's an attempt to shed a little bit more light on this claim. The idea that moral reasoning is usually engaged in after moral judgments made in which a person searches for arguments that will support an already made judgment. And as I said, this is an influential claim in its own right, quite widely accepted. And it's also part of our uh, concern with moral foundations theory, because it's a component of that theory that we've yet to see. That's coming in part two of the course, not in this lecture. All right. So what's the other part of my inconsistent dyad? It's this. Um, what we've seen is that moral reasoning can overcome effective support for judgments about not harming, and it can also overcome effective obstacles to deliberately harming others. So we're not talking about, you know, heat of the moment situations where one person punches another. We're thinking about situations where people often are required to make calm, deliberate, quite planned actions which harm other people. And many, many people have a uh, natural resistance to that as far as their feelings go and will be quite severely punished internally for deliberately, knowingly harming other people. And the point that we are considering, and we've not really looked at evidence for this yet, that's going to come later, uh, just a little bit of evidence for it, is that moral reasoning can overcome those effective obstacles. My suggestion is that these two claims are inconsistent. Uh, the second claim implies that moral reasoning has a much larger role than is compatible with the first claim, even within an individual. And that I think is really Hendrix or the heart of Hendrix's observation, although I don't think he says exactly that. So then you say, Steve, why, you know, why is this interesting? Why is this interesting? Well, actually, I think it's just intrinsically interesting. I think there's an intrinsically interesting question here about the role of reason in, um, you know, ethical abilities generally and moral intuitions in particular. Uh, and the role of reason, it turns out, is not a particularly, particularly happy one, but it is a very significant one. Um, but there's two particular reasons why this matters for us. Now, the first is just the observations of the role of reason in enabling inhumane acts appear to provide sufficient grounds to reject the view that moral intuitions are always, or even characteristically, entirely consequences of feelings. So that means that we would have to modulate an extreme view about, for example, the role of the effect heuristic. We might still say, consistently with this, that human moral intuitions are in part a consequence of how thinking about situations makes them feel, that's still consistent with this, but that can't be the full explanation for moral intuitions uh, because we think that reason must be playing some role too. So that seems like an important conclusion in itself, but there's more. See, I'm currently working on a puzzle, a question which is difficult for us to answer given the theories that we have looked at so far. I think the puzzles are important because they constrain theorizing. I want a theory that allows us to answer lots of difficult questions, so I need to know what those difficult questions are. And the puzzle that I'm working on constructing says, why are moral intuitions sometimes, but not always, a consequence of reasoning from known principles? Now, the always I take to be established not, sorry, the not always, <laughs> I take to be established by the evidence on moral dumbfounding. We have some reason, not the strongest reason, but we have some reason to think that moral intuitions aren't always entirely a consequence of reasoning from known principles. It's the research by Bandura and colleagues on inhumane acts that gives me confidence, now I can turn this green, that gives me confidence that moral intuitions are sometimes, at least in part, a consequence of reasoning from known principles. So now I've established this puzzle. And this is important because it seems to me that there are theories that are compatible with the sometimes and the theories that are compatible with the not always, but it's very hard to get a theory which is compatible with both and one which also generates novel 
readily testable predictions. So that's what we're looking for. A theory that can answer the question, is motivated post hoc by the evidence that's already available and has a chance of being known because it generates readily testable predictions. Now, what we'll do next though, before we go on uh, and think about what that theory might be, it seems to me relevant to try to make this even clearer by thinking about moral disengagement. But it's not absolutely necessary that you do that. So if you're convinced that this is really a puzzle already, then you're good to go. You can just go on and have a look at the theory later. If you're not yet convinced that moral intuitions are sometimes a consequence of reasoning from known principles, you'd like to consider the evidence more deeply, then my suggestion is that it's moral disengagement that we need to consider next.